Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Pro Black Perspective on KWZ Radio. Today we're going to continue reading Chin Weizu's articles. If you want the description, if you want the uh, PDF, you can feel free to look in the description and it's there. We're not going to do a straight reading. We're going to do an interpretive reading uh, because I believe that an interpretive reading is going to benefit us more than a straight one. Either way, um, anyone who wants an interpretive reading, sorry, anyone who wants a straight reading is free to just read the PDF themselves. It's these are a lot of these are a series of short essays, so um, hopefully that wouldn't be too much of a burden on anyone. Um, I do want to say this actually. This is pretty interesting. Maybe I'll wait for more people to show up. But I'm I'm interested in reading Chin Weizu's other book, um, The Anatomy of the Female Power. But I'm I'm of the opinion that I should just read maybe three of them. So I'm going to task those listeners with. Uh, which three do they believe I should read? Uh, just because I do want to read it for myself, but I also feel like, you know, I feel like you guys should read it for yourselves too. But I could always just start off some people. And of course, it'll be an interpretive reading. So if you don't like interpretive readings, then, you know, don't worry about it. You know, this is Chin Weizu's Anatomy of Female Power. Um, and I'll probably show this toward the end. I just wanted to uh, open it up. Make sure that it's opening on my computer. You see it's a little scratchy. Um, so as you can see, all these essays in Chin Weizu's Anatomy of Female Power are pretty short. I'll just show you the table of contents. This is how you... Uh, so here's the table of contents. You see this one is uh, three pages. Uh, this one is uh, eight pages, you know? So... The power of her body, beautiful, you know, love, male and female, courtship, you know, so uh, penalties of divorce. And that's only two pages, so maybe I'll, yeah, I'll just do three, though, because it's 16, you know, um, any more than three. And it's like, I might as well just read the whole book. Other than that, though, let's see what we can do. We're going to start off with uh, some of Chin Weizu's Garvey, Garveyism, not continentalism, is what Africa, black Africa needs. Um, so that's page 378. So for those of you who have the book, just go to page 378. I mean, all of you should have the book, but go to page 378 and you could read along, um, over here. So let's see what the comments are like. Any comments, anybody here? Well, we got two viewers, two likes. So, you know, it's not a lot for the planet, you know, considering the planet, but I appreciate everybody's presence. So thank you. Appreciation for that garveyism not continentalism talk continentalism is what black africa needs so the essence of garveyism consisted of two projects a black governments here is garvey's conclusion a century ago after traveling in the americas and europe and informing himself of the situation worldwide of black negroes he says <clears throat> i asked where is the black man's government where is his king and his kingdom where is his president his country and his ambassador his army his navy his men of big affairs i could not find them and then i declared i will help to make them so this is from philosophy's opinions volume two one two six so for those of you who don't know what volume two would mean um philosophy's opinions of marcus garvey the usual book that we read is actually two volumes right but anyway and he's formed the unia to help do that and then B, it's a black superpower in Africa. In the 1920s, Garvey diagnosed the global prospects of the blacks and prescribed the remedy when he said, the Negro is dying out. There's only one thing to save the Negro, and that is an immediate realization of his own responsibilities. Unfortunately, we are the most careless and indifferent people in the world. We are shiftless and irresponsible. It is strange to hear a Negro leader speak in this strain, as a usual course is flattery, but I would not flatter you to save my own life and that of my own family. There is no value in flattery. Must I flatter you when I find all other people preparing themselves for the struggle to survive, and you still smiling, eating, dancing, drinking, and sleeping away your time as if yesterday were the beginning of the age of pleasure i would rather be dead than to be a member of your race without thought of the morrow for it pretends to evil to him for it pretends evil to him that thinketh not 
He's like, you bring evil to yourselves, guys. Come on. Because I cannot flatter you, I am here to tell emphatically that if we do not seriously reorganize ourselves as a people and face the world with a program of African Negro nationalism, our days in civilization are numbered. And it will be only a question of time when the Negro will be as completely and complacently dead as the North American Indian or the Australian Bushman. Now, I, I do, I do, I do want to um, go into this. So this flattery idea, you know. What is this flattery idea? Oh, you built the greatest civilization on the planet. You are everything. People owe you money. You you are so good. You were so loyal. You fought in every war in the Americas. You, um, uh, I mean, that's a lot of that is directed to the Americans. But um, what is the other ones? What is the ones that, well, again, I don't know. I don't know to what he might have been referring, but that's a lot of the flattery we hear today. You know, um, actually, I guess in Africa, sometimes you might hear something like, oh, you know, they, you know, this Nigerian guy built the first supercomputer and, you know, black genius. If we were just not unhampered, we would blah, 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 blah. And, you know, oh, we're just the greatest race. And, and what about this um, the Egypt thing, you know? Oh, you know, every civilization is just copying Egypt. They just stole from Egypt and blah, 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 blah. You know, all of that is well and good, right? Except it's not. <laughs> you know, the, the reality is your race is going the way of the Native American and the Australian, the Native, the Indigenous Australian. And the only thing that's going to save us is realizing our own responsibility. So I do want to say that that's like my next book. I probably intend to uh, go in a little more about that, but it is what it is. If he says, greetings, just read the essay and looking to hear your views on it. Um, okay, I, I think he's just telling me to shut up and read. Uh, <laughs> Dan Zan says, greetings to me uh, and Kofi. Kofi says, greetings back. Learning Curve says, greetings to everybody. And everybody says, greetings back. Um, anyhow, let's, uh, let's, let's go on. So uh, this is the second part he says. He says, this is the danger point. What will become of the Negro in Africa? 500 years if he does not organize now to develop and to protect himself the answer is that he will be exterminated for the purpose of making room for the other races you know as the water situation uh comes to fore as the oil as the as the uh the, the resource the coltan situation comes to fore uh, more and more people will have an interest in the african continent and it may get to a point where they have such an interest in the African continent that they decide to move to the African continent. You understand? And when they decide to move to the African continent and, and you uh, feeling like, hey, you're encroaching on my land, they will kill you. You know, we see this with the Maasai today. The Maasai have this land. The Maasai's ownership, land claim, if you will, goes back centuries, Right if not millennia, right? And now the Arabs are like, you know what, I'd rather hunt. I'd rather hunt over there. And the government, I believe of Tanzania, the government itself is saying, okay, well, we'll give you this opportunity to hunt. I don't give a shit about these Maasai. And so if they don't care about a people with a historic land claim, if you will, why would they care about you? Most, most of us, in fact, most of us, for what it's worth, are city dwellers, right? Um, as city dwellers, we have no land claims whatsoever. We don't even have land. Most of us in cities do not have land. Um, that said, if they don't care about the people who do have land claims, why would they care about you? And I'm not telling them, I'm not saying they should care about you. I'm just saying that if you're looking to protect and organize, you organize and protect yourself, you have to go a different course. Because the course right now is that there's going to be a lot of political pressure coming from the outside to control how you behave on the inside. And eventually there may be that encroachment. You know, South Africa was that encroachment. Colonization was that encroachment. They didn't slaughter people wholesale, but it was that encroachment. And as the uh, climate changes around the planet, as... Uh, water sources become scarce as 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 what have you you know you you have to recognize that 
no one else is going to feed us. When when Ukraine cut its uh, when Ukraine was attacked by uh, Russia, uh, for good reason, right? When right when Ukraine was attacked by Russia, um, Russia, I mean the 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 food pipeline that Ukraine was po- providing for Africa was cut first. Okay, I'm still eating well in America. Just 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 FYI, people are starving elsewhere, you know. But it really comes back to what is our responsibility in in providing for our own sustenance i hope that's uh hope that makes sense hope that's to everybody's satisfaction um learning curve tells us we need to capitalize on the inventions that we create and we need to stop trusting other people to educate us why do you think that we are still so disorganized in our thinking i think we fail at knowledge transmission between the generations yeah i mean when you don't have any schools right your knowledge is continually being transmitted nowhere. You know what I mean? Like it's just being transmitted nowhere. If if I learn something and I don't pass it on to my next generation, or, or if I learn something and then um, I'd say, okay, son, if you want to learn like me, you got to go to sc- You got to go to the public school system, right? That's it. Uh, Bit of medicines comes. It says, greetings all. Hit the like button. So he's letting y'all know you got to hit the like button. So let's go. The Negro peoples of the world should concentrate upon the object of building up for themselves a great nation in Africa. We in the UNIA, and this is why I tell you guys, this is volume one, read Philosophy's Opinions of Marcus Garvey again, okay? I would advise every year, but I haven't been doing that myself, so I would just say read it again. We in the UNIA are determined to solve our own problem by redeeming our motherland Africa from the hands of alien exploiters and by the creating for ourselves there of a political super state of government, a nation of our own, strong enough to lend protection to the members of our race scattered all over the world and to compel the respect of the nations and races of the earth. Go ahead, Negro. So this is, uh, I believe this is, uh, should wait now. Oh, no, no, this is Garvey again. Go ahead, Negro, and organize yourselves. You are serving your race and guaranteeing to posterity of our own an existence which otherwise will be denied them. Ignore the traps of persuasion, advice, and alien leadership. No one can be as true to you as you can be to yourself. So suggest that there is no need for Negro racial organization as a well-planned and arranged civilization like that of the 20th century is but to, but by the game of deception, lay the trap for the destruction of a people whose knowledge of life is incomplete owing to their misunderstanding of man's purpose and creation. So what I like about Marcus Garvey, I want to say this, I want to share with you guys, is that he has this this divine purpose in terms of um, organizing. And I feel like I might want to replicate that, you know, in my own literature. The the other things, you know, I mean, for those of you who don't know, even if I, if I sound tired or if I don't sound tired, last night we were up to like 3 a.m. on the Discord discussing religion, you know? Um, so it's it's a thing, right? Um, we were discussing religion and spirituality. I was, it was surprising, but um, uh, yeah, I I want to say that you know a lot of people are going to come to this this idea of ignore the traps of persuasion, advice, and alien leadership, and and realize oh well you know a lot of the leadership now that's turned on us is black leadership you know so it really comes to something deeper than um, skin you know it's like skin folk ain't kin folk kind of thing. Um, but no, skin folk are not necessarily kin folk, but um, I do want us to, you know, respect what Marcus Garvey is sharing with us. So number two is continentalism. So continentalism is the doctrine and project of uniting the entire continent of Africa, uniting all the races that now live on it, black and white, Negro and Arab, preferably under one government that will rule the entire continent. This project has been going on since the 1958 Conference of Independent African States. Oh, you found it? Okay. Uh, This project has been going on since the 1958 Conference of Independent African States that was held in Accra, Ghana. It produced the Afro-Arab OAU, then the present Afro-Arab AU, Unmanned Arabist Underwear. Africa Unmanned Arabist Underwear, which on the brink of transforming it into an Afro-Arab U.S. of Africa. By the end of the 20th century, with the rise of black world countries in Africa and the diaspora, Garvey's first project was realized, but only partly so. 
since these black comprador governments remain fronts and agents for white supremacy and white power, and none has become a government of black people by black people and for black people. Moreover, none of these black mass governments of white supremacy has dared to embark on the second and vitally urgent Garvey project of creating a black superpower that would be in the same power rank as China and the G8. You know, it's sad because Africa's huge. The dangers which Garvey pointed out in the 1920s are still with the black race. If anything, they had been intensified and augmented by such disasters as the AIDS bombing of black Africa by the USA and the WHO, World Health Organization. These are the same people um, telling us to get vaccinated from the um, COVID vaccine. Arab expansionism and colonialism in the Afro-Arab conflict zones that stretches from Mauritania to Somalia, including the Afro-Arab war theaters in Chad, Darfur, and South Sudan, UN imperialism, which through the IMF, World Bank, and WTO has inflicted debt, trap, peonage, economic maldevelopment, and deepening poverty of the black countries of the world. Black powerlessness continues without let up, and the black extension that Garvey alerted us to is already underway. Whereas Garveyism correctly focuses on our developing the black power we need to defeat these dangers and protect ourselves from all dangers, continentalism says nothing at all about power, let alone about black power. It doesn't even offer to create black unity. It focuses on a unification of the entire continent, which translates into Afro-Arab unification. Since the Arabs have, for nearly 2,000 years, been white invaders, exploiters, and enslavers of black Africa, Afro-Arab unification is like a unification of black lambs with white lions that eat lambs. A uh, unification whereby the lambs end up in the stomach of the lions. The Arabs would naturally love, welcome, and eagerly promote such unification. And that's what, that's what this, was, this was really about. It was really about following the political agenda of the Arabs. But isn't it suicidal for the black Africans to agree with it, let alone campaign eagerly for it, as some have done for the last 50 years? And, and this, is, this is a thing even today. For the basic reason, continentalism, with all its projects, OAU, U.S. of Africa, is the mortal enemy of black Africans. Okay? Continentalism is the mortal enemy of black Africans. Okay? Those blacks who are deluded into thinking... Let me actually check the comments. Let me see what the comments are like. Um, Kofi just says greetings. Um, he just says greetings. Uh, all right. Let's go. Keep going. Uh, for the base, oh yeah. So those blacks who are deluded into thinking that Afro-Arab unification would be good for Black Africans would do well to find out just how rosy life has been for those blacks who have lived under Arab colonialism since the 1950s, especially in Darfur and South Sudan, where the blacks have taken up armed struggle to escape Arab colonialism and racism. So number three, the Garveyite Black Survival Project. We do not need to politically integrate or federate all the 53 Arab and black African neocolonial states of the African continent to produce a black African super state that can protect all black Africans wherever they are on earth. To implement the Garvey idea, what we need above all is just one black African country, big and industrialized enough and therefore powerful enough to be of G8 rank, a country that could serve as the core state protector and leader of global black Africa. And see, this is really what we want to do. This is kind of, like, I'm thinking that maybe my book should focus on on this. I just don't know uh, how, to, how to title it so that people can actually read it, you know? But anyway, we also need a black African league and should be the and shall be the collective security organization of global black Africa or equivalent of NATO and the defunct war pact. These are the two things we need in the 21st century to implement the Garvey requirement for black African survival. For building a black African superpower as urged by Garvey, an ECOWAS or SADC federation or some equivalent in East or Central Africa is more than enough. Just one of them, if integrated and industrialized by 2060, would meet the need. ECOWAS or SADC is big enough in territorial size, population, and resource endowment to become an industrialized and world power, provided its neocolonial character is eliminated. Let's look at the numbers. So he's talking about the population in 1993. ECOWAS, so I think this is the, uh, I think this is West African states, you know, the economic community, or something like that. I don't remember what SADC is, but, you know, basically what he's saying is this is 6.5 million square kilometers and 185 million people, right? This is 7 130 million. This is Brazil, on the other hand, in the same year, 
would be uh, it's pretty large 8.5 million uh, america is pretty large 9.5 million and 256 million people uh, russia is huge 17.1 million and it's 148 million people uh, India is obviously a huge population. China is obviously a huge population, right? India is actually more population dense. You can see 900 million people um, on a small 3.3. It's actually one of the smallest. Well, EU is pretty um, up there too. Anyway, so this is ECOWAS with 16 states, 6.5 uh, million square kilometers and nearly 20 million population or SADC with 11 million, 11 states. 7 million square kilometers and some 130 million population would be a country of subcontinental size and in the mega state league in territory and population and resource to which belong the USA, Brazil, and Russia, India, etc. Uh, ECOWAS or SADC if properly integrated, industrialized, and thoroughly decolonized would be a mega state of the type black Africa needs. So why don't we get on with the task of building each into a power of G8 rank, why set off on the false and diversionary and dangerous mission of Arab, Black, African state integration or of the impotent neo-colonialist OAU, AU, USA type? So why not exactly? And so I want you guys to see this. So each of the power. So this right here, this sort of pan-Africanism was the one the NA was going for. And the one that and the one that we got this old Arab Black African state was the one Nkrumah went for, and Nkrumah it's you know, uh, Bit of Madison and I we, we we read a paper together, where they discussed how Nkrumah sabotaged Niede's, uh effort. So make sure you guys check out the Bit of Medicine podcast and that that particular joint podcast that we did. Uh, learning curve wrote a comment so let's uh let's look at that one she says uniting all of africa at once is not possible we need to see it done before we decide to unite uh we try to be anything but african because we don't see africans as successful yeah a lot, a lot of people a lot of people are trying to like like that's one of the issues like if we do not succeed in africa then people don't want to be african you know and it makes sense you know a lot of times you want to associate with the success um you know, if, if, if you're like, for instance, I got this child, right? You know, if your child is, is, is doing great, then you're like, hey, that's my child over there. And if your child is like the local criminal, you're like, oh, I see. I, I've seen that boy around. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's not even a, it's not the worst thing. Uh, of course, ending their neocolonial character is anathema to the black colonialists who now misrule the black African countries. These Comprador would rather set off on a quest for an unjustified U.S. of Africa that would still have the neocolonial character that suits the Comprador interest and temperament. The second component of the Garvey Project is to replace the OAU AU with a proper collective security organization for global Black Africa, an organization to which the Black African diaspora countries and communities will rightfully belong. It is one of the blemishes of continentalist Pan-Africanism that is embodied at the interstate level in an OAU AU from which the diaspora originators of Pan-Africanism have long been excluded, whereas the Arab enemies of Black Africa are not only members, but the dominant Black the black African diaspora are only now being brought into the OAU AU structure as an afterthought and is no more than a second class members. That is not how it should be. So I think this is called like the seventh district or the sixth district, but there is like a, a notion that the African diaspora um, are also a part of the, uh, the AU. Um, but again, you know, the, the most important part is who is the dominant black? You know what I mean? Uh, who is the dominant black? So anyway. Uh, the history of black Africans demands that we replace the Arab castrated OAU AU with a black only collective security organization and not with yet another Arab castrated outfit called the US of Africa. So hopefully uh, this is probably the last page. Let me actually check. Yes, yeah, the last page. OK, so. So again, man, again, uh, you know, guys, uh, get your comments in before we uh, we end. But we're going to blend soon, I guess. But just get your comments in. Oh, we're going to talk about anatomy and stuff. Uh, but anyway, unless the members of a group are keen for their group to survive, the group will most probably not survive. For its members will fail to do what must be done for their group to survive. And any such group does not deserve to survive. If black Africans wish to survive, they must profoundly change their priorities. Not slothful consumerism here on earth, not paradise for their souls in the hereafter, but collective security here on earth must become their ruling passion. 
right? We're going to have to work on that. So those black Africans who are keen for the black African people to survive in the 21st century and beyond will have to ensure that the Garvey Black Survival Project is accomplished in the shortest possible time, starting yesterday, right? They have two paramount tasks to accomplish simultaneously. One, they must by all means necessary politically integrate and complete the abandoned decolonization of ECOWAS and SADC and affect their exit from maldevelopment by industrializing them into powers of G8 rank. And two, they must build a black African league that will organize the collective security of the black African world. Um, so that's Chin Weizu. Again, like I said, he read he wrote Anatomy of Female Power. And uh, before we get into that, I wanna I want to I want to discuss with you guys just a little bit um, the reality that I only wrote a book. So I wrote a book. Um, make sure you guys, if you don't have it already. You can check it out. If you didn't give it a five star rating yet, you know, you can do that. Um, but basically, this is the book that I wrote um, back in 2019. Uh, I, I want to write another one. I'm not really too inspired, but uh, I'm getting there. You know, this is this is helping me, obviously. So make sure you guys check it out. If you want any more information, you know, just go to the website, go to Amazon.com, search Book of Power, search my name and uh, you can. Uh, you know, hopefully that's that's all you need. Um, outside of that, I want to go back to uh, this PDF. So essentially, after I finish reading the select essays, I want to read three of these essays. So this is um, Chin Wei uh, um Anatomy of Female Power, a masculinist dissection of matriarchy. So I want to just read three essays. A lot of them are short, like one page. It looks like, and uh, and uh, this one's eight pages. This one is five pages. Oh, this one's 13 pages, right? Um, but, like, I'll just probably read this my, on my own. Uh, but I might just want to just read three for you guys. So let me know which three you want me to read. And I'll probably read it in a way such that I'll read up to that chapter. And then when I get to that chapter, I can read it for you guys. Um, so just let me know um, what, which three looks the most interesting. You know, it could be the double standard. It could be the silly souls of men. Or whatever and and then we could just move on from there but other than that um, that's all I really wanted to say today that's all I wanted to do today I'm gonna start my day off um, oh I see like it's a comment um, okay it's Bobby Wright telling us greetings to everybody um, but that's all I wanted to say today so if nothing else it looks like there's no more comments so Shemim Hotep Anku Johnson Neb Neb Amen Ma'at Dua Netra